Which then will you choose? To follow your leader into battle or to endure a life of taxation, labor in the mines, and all the other tribulations of slavery? Whether you choose to endure these forever or to take quick vengeance, this field must decide. Scotland was one of the last parts of Europe to be settled, and from the beginning, her people guarded a country hard won. and volcanic eruptions shaped the land 40 million years ago. Four ice ages followed. The land was split and eroded. As the last ice melted, straths and glens were formed. Ground became more sheltered and fertile. But wet weather followed and peat bog covered much of the land. At last there was wildlife and finally man. Morton in North Fife, once on the seashore when the tide rose 25 feet higher around Scotland 8,000 years ago. Here men came north by sea to look for food. They were nomads, hunters in search of fish, birds and mammals. In groups of three or four they came and went for over 2,000 years. Some lived in caves like those at Weems in Fife and left their mark. Men from Ireland, less than 20 miles from Scotland, also crossed to fish and to beachcomb. Scotland's early visitors, small in number. From Europe came Scotland's first farmers colonists with livestock and seed. They brought the crops of wheat, barley and rye still grown in Scotland. Man came to Scarabray in Orkney, a near perfect Stone Age village. Here lived a community of no more than 30. Each house had a hearth and furniture of stone, stone beds, stone cupboards, stone chairs. The people fished for cod and had domesticated animals like cattle and sheep. They also lived off shellfish and grew some grain. From the beginning, Scotland was a land of coastal settlements. To go inland meant forest and swamp and wild animals. Stone from Rum and Arran found its way to Fife and southeast Scotland by boat. Axes from Antrim were used by communities in Lewis, Shetland and Aberdeenshire. Boats came too from the English Lake District and North Wales. Flint found its way from Yorkshire. Communities few and far between, but not without knowledge of each other. Jarlshof in Shetland. Folk first came here to live 4,000 years ago. They ate limpets and mussels and made a living rearing soy sheep and cattle. 
their homes, like those found in Crete in the Aegean. Stone Age man got religion, cairns to honor the dead. At Mays How in Orkney, the stone slabs weigh up to three tons, built by people who had no trees to make levers and rollers to help them. Tombs used by families or tribes are found all over Orkney. For the early folk, life was hard. In death, a struggle honored. From the Rhine came the Beaker people, so called because they lay beakers in their tombs. They may have built the circles at Staness and Brodger in Orkney. Ceremonial centers that took years to erect. The focus of religious ritual, gathering places for the tribe. Kalanish on the island of Lewis, the same structure. But remote on Lewis, man was not alone. At Mycenae in Greece, at Stonehenge in England, the same circles, a culture shared. With the discovery of bronze came metal axes with wooden handles. Bronze daggers, forerunners of the dirk. Bronze shields, forerunners of the Highland Targe. Ireland was the chief center for the manufacture of bronze, and Scotland's early settlers were tireless seamen, traveling to Ireland, the Outer Hebrides and Europe. The most powerful were fond of displaying their wealth. Chiefs among men, leaders of warriors and their families. A thousand years before Christ, the Celtic people first came from Europe. The Celts were skilled in working iron. Now it was easier to make armor and weapons. Settlements like Trepain Law in East Lothian, had to be fortified as tribal warfare became a way of life. Hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, hill forts like Craig Fadrig were built all over Scotland. Men also built artificial islands, crannogs, for shelter. Sea raiders in search of slaves for the Roman Empire were the threat by the century before Christ. The firebrand and the spear, the weapons of the day. To protect themselves, settlers built fortified towers, called brochs. In the year 80, Gnaeus Julius Agricola, governor of the province of Britannia, invaded the north. With an army of 20,000, he reached the River Tay and built forts. Three years later, he came north again to secure Galloway and campaigned in Murrayshire while his Roman fleet supplied him. His plan of campaign was later imitated by others bent on conquering Scotland. At the Pass of Grange, the Battle of Mons Graupius, 5,000 Romans faced 30,000 tribesmen urged into battle by their leader, Calgacus. When I consider the motives we have for fighting, and the critical position we are in, I get the strong feeling that the united front you have shown today could mean the dawn of liberty for the whole of Britain. We, the most distant dwellers on earth, the last of the free, have been shielded by that very remoteness. There are no nations beyond us, only the waves and rocks and the Romans, more deadly still than these. They are the only people on earth to whose covetousness both riches and poverty are equally tempting. To butchery, robbery and rape, they give the lying name of government. They create a desolation and call it peace. The Romans killed Calgacus and thousands of the Caledonians. Those who survived retreated to the hills, beaten in battle, but unconquered. Emperor Hadrian ordered the construction of a wall from the River Tyne to the Solway to keep out the tribes said to have slaughtered an entire Roman legion based at York. 
and around the year 143, Lollius Urbicus was sent to Britain to try again to bring the tribes of the north to heel. The Antonine Wall from the rivers forth to Clyde was built and Lollius reoccupied much of the land taken by Agricola. But after 40 years, the Romans were again forced south. They pulled down their forts, but they left a legacy. By attempting to conquer, the Romans helped unify the tribes of Scotland. When they first came, they found 17 tribes. Within 250 years, there were only four main peoples. The most enigmatic were the painted people, the Picts. Celts from Europe, the Picts had settled on Scotland's east coast. In time, their federated kingdoms stretched from the Pentland or Pictland hills to the Pentland Firth. Ornate symbol stones, proof of a cultured people, But of the Picts, we know little else. They left no written language, no records. But their chiefs probably descended through the females, a custom still upheld by a few Scots families. This way you could ensure that at least half the blood was of the old bloodline. Because a man might marry a girl as the heir, and she might have an affair with someone else and produce a child which was held to be the child of that man but in fact contains none of the blood of the old line. And if you believe in a hereditary pr principle and therefore trying to breed in uh, strength, new strength into your, into your hereditary system, um, that's no good because you've suddenly lost it all on one, at one blow. The Britons were to dominate the West. Their land stretched from Strathclyde, south through Cumbria to Wales. The Angles from Germany settled southeast Scotland. Warlike and hungry for land, they drove out Britons living there and carved out their kingdom. The fourth tribe were the Scots from Ireland, then called Scotia. They too were Celtic, a warrior society, combative and expansive. They came in small family groups around the year 500. Donad in Argyll was the capital of their main kingdom, Dalriada. A footprint in a rock marks where their Irish sub-kings were invested with power, according to ancient custom. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Much of Scotland became Christian long before England. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Every year at Whithorn in Kirkubrisha, they still commemorate the man who is said to have brought Christianity to Scotland, Ninian, born around the year 350. He was a Briton and he went abroad to the continent and was ordained priest at Rome. Then he came back to Scotland and evangelized Galloway and built the stone church that they called the White House, now Whithorn. And then he evangelized the southern Picts in Fife and Perthshire. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has Ninian's followers at Whithorn may have taken the new faith as far north as the Shetland Islands. The Scots of Dalriada had Irish missionaries of their own. St. Oran probably established the first monastic community on Iona. But Columba from Donegal was the missionary who made the Scots a dominant tribe. He may have had good reason to leave Ireland. He borrowed a psalter from somebody, made a copy, and the man who owned the Psalter took the law against him and won the case, and Columba was very aggrieved. So he took a vow to go to Scotland in exile. But now that's the legend. I'm sure the reality is that Irish monasticism was simply expanding. 
Columba arrived at Iona in 563 with 12 followers. A skillful politician, he helped the Scots, who owed allegiance to an Irish king, become independent. Columba was of royal race on both sides, and it was a relative of his, a king in Argyll, who gave the monastery land. And then Columba was a key figure in getting independence of the mother country for Argyll. The Irish Celtic church was monastic, like the great religious houses of Europe that were to come to Scotland in the Middle Ages, and demanded poverty and obedience from its clergy, who were monks, not priests. Remote caves became places of austere contemplation, and lonely islands sought after sites for new monasteries. Conversion brought about a flowering of Pictish art. The influence of those Celtic monks and the peoples that they evangelized was crucial. If you talk about the people themselves, I think the primitive people stayed pretty bloodthirsty. And I think that their Christianity was well mixed with uh, Celtic pagan lore. Oswald, king of Northumbria, was converted to the Celtic church while at Iona. He invited Aidan, one of Columba's disciples, to set up a monastery at Lindisfarne, off the coast of Northumberland. Iona plus Northumbria produced the Lindisfarne Gospels. They took learning into England and the continent. But Oswald's Anglo-Saxon queen was a follower of the Church of Rome. The differences between the church in the Irish Celtic church and more or less the rest of Europe the, is that the Irish church was organized on this monastic tribal basis and the other churches were had territorial bishops and they had considerable differences of right and then one big difference was that the Irish had held on to an old system of calculating Easter and found themselves out of line with the more or less the rest of Christendom. Oswald's court celebrated Christ's resurrection twice a year. In 663 he invited representatives of the two churches to meet at Whitby in Yorkshire to resolve the dilemma. The king called a synod and then made a, a joke about St. Peter being the, uh, the, keeping the keys of the kingdom of heaven so he'd go on to his side. Oswald's decision not only put paid to the Celtic faith in Northumbria, but also in Scotland. Roman orthodoxy slowly replaced Celtic monasticism. Christianity was a new and powerful magic. Relics of Columba and his disciples were venerated, like the monimus reliquary, said to have contained bones of the Scots religious leader. In 732, the bones of St Andrew were brought to Scotland. One of the Twelve Apostles, Andrew became Scotland's patron saint, when a refugee angle from Hexham in England brought the relics to Kilrymond in the heart of Pictland. Kilrymond in Fife later became a cathedral town, St Andrews. In 685, the Picts had been threatened by the Angles of Northumbria. Here at Dunnechen near Forfa, they won the Battle of Nechtensmere and put paid to Northumbrian rule extending north. Had the battle gone the other way, a nation called Scotland might never have happened at all. The Vikings, plunderers from Norway. From the 8th century, Scotland's monastic settlements with their silver, gold and precious manuscripts 
were sources of booty. Islands like Iona were frequent targets. At Martyrs Bay in 806, the entire Iona community was murdered. The monks of St. Ninian's Isle in Shetland were also attacked and buried all that was of value. Their hoard of 8th century gold and silver was not discovered until 1958. But by the 9th century, the Vikings came to Scotland to settle. Overpopulation on Norway's east coast forced many to take boat for islands they already knew well. They settled Jarlshof in Shetland around the year 800, built their homes and worked the land. Viking colonists also went west to the Hebrides. In Lewis, over a hundred villages still have Norse names. From the Western Isles, the Norsemen settled Ireland, the Faroes and Iceland. Their long ships gave them mastery of the seas and present day Scots of the islands owe skills to their Norse origins. Orkney and Shetland became part of the Norse Kingdom, which threatened established tribes. By the middle of the 8th century, the Norsemen had moved into the Pictish Kingdom. In the west, they attacked the Scots of Dalriada, who had expanded north into Argyll and east. Their capital, Dunstaffnage near Oban, was threatened, and under the leadership of Kenneth MacAlpin, the Scots moved inland. The Vikings helped the Scots and Southern Picts create an enlarged kingdom called Alba, with Schoon the capital. On the stone of Schoon, Kenneth MacAlpin, King of Scots, was made King of Picts. Kings of Scots were made at Schoon. I say made and not crowned because anointing was enough in order to king make, particularly if you had the stone. Going back uh, thousands of years, there was blood, uh, first to human sacrifice was used as to anoint kings, uh, then the blood of probably a bull or some valuable animal, and then, as I say, when they began to think this was perhaps rather unattractive, uh, they brought in oil instead for the anointing of a king. Go! The Scots now headed a precocious kingdom, and yet they accounted for less than a tenth of Scotland's people. The Scots became dominant through battle and marriage. The Celtic Scots passed kingship down by way of the male, the Celtic Picts by way of the female. Marriage put paid to the Pictish system. When you got a male descent system coming in, which was the, the Teutonic system coming in with the Scots, um, that naturally supplanted it because the male took over the system of admin administration and being dominant put on the new system of descent. And so the Picts were effectively, their system was bred out of existence. It was married out of existence. <laughs> Alba grew. On the banks of the Tweed, King Malcolm II defeated a Northumbrian army, brought the rich Lothians under his rule. Malcolm's successor, Duncan I, became King of Strathclyde and thus incorporated the southwest into the kingdom. Under Macbeth, who killed Duncan, North and South Scotland were united. But Macbeth was killed by Malcolm Canmore, Duncan's son. Malcolm, brought up in exile, became King of Scots in 1058 with English help. Never again were the emerging kings of England to leave the North alone.